So in 2014, Cabbage turned 50. Um, Dr. Sabaston at Duke uh, uh, attempted a coronary artery bypass operation in 1962. The patient sadly did not survive. And uh, in 1964, Ed Garrett, Dr. DeBakey, and Dr. Howell um, uh, performed the first successful coronary bypass operation at this institution right here in Houston. Um, uh, all three of those uh, uh, gentlemen have sadly passed away. Uh, it's interesting to note that in 1964, Professor Kolosov in uh, Russia performed the first lima to the LED, and this was done uh, through a mini thoracotomy approach, and what most people don't know is that, in fact, he used an anastomotic device to perform the anastomosis. Um, this is a glass slide, or, or taken from the original glass slide of that first operation, and um, um, uh, showing the pre-op angiogram and uh, the post-op angiogram, and with the eye of faith, you can probably see that uh, here is the patent saphenous vein graft uh, in this patient that uh, uh, Dr. Garrett Howell and DeBakey operated on back in 1964. So the evolution of cardiopulmonary bypass really goes back to the, uh, sorry, the evolution of cabbage really goes back uh, to the uh, invention of cardiopulmonary bypass, which was invented in the early 1950s by James Gibbon, um, uh, and um, angiography uh, by Soans in the Cleveland Clinic in 1962, which was obviously essential uh, uh, in order to be able to look at coronary anatomy. Cardioplegia, which was a means to safely arrest the heart during the case, uh, was developed in the early 1970s. Mark Brainbridge at St. Thomas's Hospital in London and Brett Schneider in Germany were both instrumental in developing cardioplegic solutions, which are still used uh, uh, throughout the world today. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, off-pump coronary artery bypass surgery uh, uh, began to be performed, and uh, minimally invasive techniques for coronary bypass surgery uh, have been performed really for the last 10 or 15 years in selected patients. We're not going to talk about those techniques. Uh, this talk is going to focus on uh, cabbage uh, in general as a therapy. So the evidence for coronary bypass surgery really exists in three large trials that came out in the 70s and the 80s, and these are very important trials that you should be make yourself familiar with if you haven't done so already. All of these compared cabbage to medical therapy, and less than 10% of the patients received a lima graft. Medical therapy then, of course, was not what it is today. These are the studies, the VA study, the European Coronary Surgery Study, and the Coronary Artery Surgery Study. The first of these showed that in patients with triple vessel disease and poor left ventricular function, um, cabbage was superior. The second, in patients with left main disease, triple vessel disease, or double vessel disease with a significant proximal LAD lesion, cabbage was superior. And the last showed that in patients with triple vessel disease and patients with an impaired ejection fraction, cabbage was superior to medical therapy. In 1994, uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, uh, performed a meta-analysis that was published in The Lancet, another good one to look at, which basically updated uh, data from seven randomized controlled trials of cabbage versus medical therapy. Uh, about 2,500 patients followed over 10 years and showed that cabbage improved survival and symptoms uh, with the benefits seen most readily in patients with triple vessel disease, left main stenosis, impaired left ventricle, severe symptoms, and a positive exercise ECG. Now, it's important to note that in these trials, the benefits of cabbage uh, were underestimated for severe disease because most patients who were enrolled were relatively low risk by today's standards. The results were analyzed on an intention to treat basis, and the crossover from medical to cabbage group was very large, 40% of patients. Also, only 10% of patients in these historical trials uh, received an IMA. In spite of this, they were able to demonstrate that in those groups of patients that I pointed out, basically patients with severe coronary artery disease, cabbage had a very significant advantage over medical therapy. PCI wasn't in the picture yet. There was no survival benefit for cabbage in single or double vessel disease and normal LV function. So this is a timeline of the trials that, was done, that have been done in coronary artery disease. This slide is not really legible, but I put it up to demonstrate sort of a broad timeline uh, over the last 50 years. 
And on the bottom are a series of trials that have been done in yellow uh, comparing uh, revascularization of any kind, whether it's cabbage or PCI versus medical therapy. And, um, uh, and, and on the top is basically comparisons of PCI versus cabbage. In blue, trials that were conducted early on looking at plain old balloon angioplasty. Uh, in red, the trials that were conducted uh, looking at bare metal stents versus cabbage. And since then, really since the late uh, 2000s, uh, cl close to 2007, 2008, all of the trials uh, that have been conducted comparing those two modalities have, have looked at um, uh, drug eluding stents versus, versus cabbage. Uh, the major morbidity of cabbage uh, is stroke, um, which is multifactorial. Cardiopulmonary bypass may have a role to play. The aorta, uh, uh, a pre-existing cerebrovascular disease, because these patients, of course, have got, uh, have, have, have got a disease all over. Myocardial infarction, uh, um, uh, kidney and lung problems. And you can calculate the specific risks with the STS calculator, something that you should use in your patients that, are, that you're contemplating sending for coronary bypass surgery. It's available online. You simply Google STS risk calculator. The top hit that comes up will be the STS risk calculator. It takes about three or four minutes to go through it. It's a very easy form. You simply plug in various things that it asks you to plug in. And at the end of it, it spits out uh, a risk for the patient, mortality risk, risk of stroke, et cetera, et cetera. And it does this by culling information from a database that has now almost two million patients. What it does is it compares your patient characteristics with those of patients that are in the database and looks at the outcomes for similar patients in the STS database. It's very reliable and uh, it's something that we do routinely for all patients uh, undergoing coronary bypass surgery now. There's a variety of conduits that can be used. I'm not going to go into it. Arterial conduits, uh, venous conduits, etc. You can do cabbage on pump, off pump, minimally invasive techniques. And hybrid philosophies are something which have been talked about for the last five years or so, meaning a combination of PCI versus a lemma to the LAD. We don't really know where the place of that is. Uh, there is a large NIH-sponsored trial that is about to begin, and our institution is going to be part of that. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have an answer to that. Now, PCI and coronary disease. PCI claims equivalence to coronary bypass surgery and therefore claims parallel benefit over medical therapy based on the trials that were done comparing cabbage to medical therapy. Uh, now, the COURAGE trial, uh, New England Journal, April of 2007, looked at PCI versus medical therapy. Almost 2,500 patients who were randomized uh, to PCI with optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone, and they showed that there was no difference in death or MI up to seven years follow-up. However, PCI was shown to be clearly superior at relieving angina, but not myocardial infarction or death. So it was very, very effective at relieving symptoms, much more effective than medical therapy in appropriately selected patients. So we're getting a clearer idea as to the role that PCI has to play, which is an extremely valuable therapy, uh, but the role or the, the subset of patients that benefit most from it is becoming more and more clearly defined. Now, this is a very important trial, the most important trial that I think you need to be aware of in the modern era comparing PCI versus cabbage. It's, it's the Syntax trial. The five-year results were published in the Lancet, uh, sorry, in Lancet uh, 2013. Um, you, if you take the trouble to read one trial in great detail, you must read this one. Um, it was a randomized controlled trial of drug eluting stents versus cabbage, 85 centers in Europe and the US, all comers to mimic the real world, and f almost 4,500 patients were screened. Now, the next line is the most astonishing thing to me. 71% of these patients were enrolled, which is absolutely unheard of in trials of this nature, and it really bolsters the validity of the results that we get from it. 58% of these were randomized equally, and the rest were enrolled in a registry. Most of these were deemed to be too complex for PCI, so they weren't randomized. All of these were screened by a heart team, and the composite endpoint of death, stroke, MI, and repeat revascularization was used to compare outcomes. 
Most important contribution, I think, of the syntax trial was the development of the syntax score, which for the first time was able to numerically identify the severity of coronary artery disease, not something we, we had done before. And they took the trouble to do that, and I think it's a very valuable contribution. And this is a diagram that shows you how they do it. They basically look at the different vessels and the severity of stenosis in each of the vessels, assign a score to each of them, and ultimately come up with a syntax score for the patient. So there's three vessel disease and there's three vessel disease, meaning you can have three vessel disease with a syntax score of 21 where you've got you know, a tight proximal stenosis but not much else downstream, or a patient with uh, a tight proximal stenosis and tandem lesions further down with disease in the, in the, in the, in the other coronary systems, and he's got a much higher syntax score uh, indicating much more uh, diffuse uh, and severe coronary artery disease. So they looked at three terciles of patients, low syntax score, intermediate syntax score, and high syntax score and use the syntax score really to dissect out the differences between these two therapies for the treatment of patients with triple vessel disease. And the overall results indicated that at five years, there was a clear advantage for patients who had, who had, had cabbage versus, um, um, uh, versus uh, a drug-eluting stent, the taxa stent uh, in this case, but I'll show you why in a moment, why I don't think it's relevant what type of drug-eluting stent it is. Um, and um, when they broke it down further and they looked at patients with a low syntax score, interestingly, they found that, that, uh, that drug-eluting stents did almost as well. In fact, there was no discernible difference at five years. So this is another great contribution in showing that PCI has a very, very important role to play in this subset of patients with triple vessel disease that have got severe proximal lesions and not much else going on, a low syntax score. Very important contribution that this trial made, I think, here. Uh, they showed that once you got to an intermediate score, a syntax score of 23 to 32, the difference between cabbage and PCI was now significant. The curves are diverging and continue to diverge at five years. And when you looked at the high score, no surprise, the difference was even greater. So the Freedom Trial in the New England Journal 2012, I looked at cabbage versus PCI in diabetics. And here, in contradistinction to the, um, to the syntax trial, um, out of uh, 34,000 patients that were screened, 3,000 were found to be eligible, and only 1,900 were enrolled, 6% of the initial number of patients that were screened. So this, I think, reduces the external validity of the trial. The data may be internally valid, but externally, you know, you can say maybe it's something that's not, it calls into question the real world application of it to some degree, something to bear in mind. But overall, in any case, they were able to show that cabbage uh, was superior to PCI when it came to death, MI, revascularization with the curves continuing to diverge at two years. Cabbage was superior in all subgroups, irrespective of syntax score, but it's worth noting that the stroke rate was significantly higher in patients with cabbage at 5.2% versus 2.4% for patients having PCI. There are registry data which looked at three vessel disease, and this is just one of them. The New England, the uh, the the New York registry data, which which uh, which uh, give the same sort of uh, conclusion. So why is cabbage better than PCI? Well, um, PCI treats an isolated lesion in the proximal vessel. <clears throat> The complexity of the lesion affects the outcome. If you have a really complex lesion and you're trying to treat it with a stent, it matters. Um, cabbage bypasses the proximal two-thirds of the vessel where the current lesion and future threatening lesions will occur. So the complexity of the lesion is irrelevant. It makes no difference to doing a cabbage because you're not doing anything to the lesion. You're going beyond it. You're bypassing it and other segments of the vessel beyond it that are diseased but not significantly diseased as yet, but where disease progression may occur. So this advantage of cabbage will persist even if, stents, even if stent restenosis is zero, because even if you had a stent that had a zero restenosis rate, that stent would only treat a single lesion and not any lesions beyond it. 
this is provocative, so maybe I shouldn't show it, but I will. But in any case, in 2006, in The Lancet, a medical journal, uh, on the cover, they said that at that time, and this is 10 years ago now, in view of the survival benefits shown for cabbage, the real controversy is why patients with symptoms and anatomy known to benefit are still sub submitted to PCI. So, what is it about cabbage? Is it the lemma? Well, we know that the lemma, the left internal mammary artery, or more correctly referred to as the left internal thoracic artery, is protected from atherosclerosis, and we don't know why. It's the unquestioned standard uh, in surgery for coronary artery disease, and a very important metric in how institutions today in the United States are rated by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Uh, there's a one, two, or three-star rating that's given to an institution, and a full 15% of that rating, the weighting that go the weighting that goes behind that rating um, is, is, is based on your use of the internal mammary artery. It's impossible to fully dissect the independent benefits of the IMA versus the SVG in the same patient because no head-to-head -head trial of SVG-only bypass versus stents would be ethical, given what we know about the lemma. Any comparison of SVG to stents would be quasi-scientific at best. Nonetheless, most surgeons and cardiologists agree that the majority of cabbage benefit rests with the IMA. Uh, Dr. Loop, in his seminal paper in 1986 from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, uh, first dramatically demonstrated the influence of Lima on 10-year survival. And a study in 2009 from the Cleveland Clinic, which looked at almost 5,000 patients who had had previous coronary bypass surgery and who had a patent Lima and who came back with symptoms showed that there was no survival benefit for intervention, no survival benefit for intervention if the lemur was patent. What you could do to help these patients is help their symptoms by medical therapy, redo cabbage, or PCI. But you couldn't make them live any longer if they had a patent lemur. Vein grafts don't do very well. We know this, and this is a one-year angiographic study of vein grafts that was done, the PREVENT study, which showed that the failure rate was an astonishing 25% at one year. Most of these, of course, were, were asymptomatic, but it's, 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 it's worth noting that vein grafts do not do well. And this is a study, this, the SPIRIT-4 study, which is now uh, six years old, which showed that the target lesion uh, failure rate at one year was 4.2% as compared to 25% for vein grafts. So for specific focal lesions, we know that PCI works very well. The FAME-2 trial looked at patients with stable coronary artery disease and at least one stenosis with FFR less than 0.8, and they randomized them to medical therapy versus FFR-guided PCI. Um, it was stopped uh, with an endpoint of death, MI, or urgent revascularization. It was stopped after uh, 888 patients because the Data Safety Monitoring Board showed that there was already a clear benefit for PCI versus medical therapy uh, in these patients. Um, the latest guidelines uh, for the treatment of stable coronary artery disease are available for you to look at uh, from the European Society of uh, Cardiology and the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery. Uh, the American Heart Association guidelines, I believe the latest ones are from 2012. It's a good thing to look these up because with each specific category, uh, you will have references, key references that would allow you to quickly look up the basis for the decisions that you make in your patients every day. And it's very important to do the guidelines are a great way, you know, to keep up to date with stuff and to look at the relevant literature on the subject. So future trends, the Lima for life, as we talked about, stents for symptoms and best medical therapy. I think that the future for coronary artery disease is a multidisciplinary approach. It's like cancer. It is a very, very nuanced and complicated thing. It's not just coronary artery disease. When you start treating it in earnest when you go into practice, you'll understand how many complexities there are to the treatment of patients with coronary artery disease. Um, I think that a convergence of best medical therapy, PCI, and cabbage is a natural thing to happen. The syntax score was a major contribution. The role of hybrid procedures is, is, is as yet undefined, and we'll know hopefully in the next three or four years whether this is a good thing. And I do think that a heart team approach which encompasses at least an interventional cardiologist and a surgeon, and preferably a non-interventional cardiologist as well, 
uh, for the evaluation of patients with ischemic heart disease uh, will be essential for optimum care in the future. Already at our institution twice a month, uh, uh, for the last few years, we, we, we host an ischemic heart disease conference where we look at patients with, you know, coronary artery disease, and you'd be, you'd be amazed. The patients with, with the most obvious treatment options that you would look at and say, oh, he needs a cabbage or he needs a PCI, the most obvious patients will generate a vigorous discussion, disagreement, because you can find anything out there to support a point of view. It's still, you know, th th there are certain things that have been resolved very clearly, and I've tried to point those out to you, but there are many, many others which remain unresolved. Thank you.